Okay, so now I'm going to provide a somewhat different point of view, uh, not 100% in disagreement, but uh, give you a sort of a different overview of where I see the conflict lines coming in the oil market uh, in, the, in the current uh, economic crisis and in the sort of geopolitics we have today. Um, and I'm going to take the position that the conflict that Dr. Clear has talked about uh, and written about in his books uh, are possible, but history has not moved us in that direction, not in, in the last few decades. That actually what we've seen in the last few decades is that big consuming nations like the United States or Japan or China uh, and Europe have found many different mechanisms uh, to resolve uh, shortages of resources, especially shortages in oil, um, and that those systems are working. We have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve here in the United States, and we can release that in coordination with our partners in Europe. Uh, what we saw during Iraq's invasion of Kuwait um, is that the community of nations work together um, to have a combination of uh, allied oil producers increase their production and a combined use of strategic storage uh, supplies in both Europe and the United States and Japan to use effectively to prevent uh, the kind of shortages that might have plagued any particular economy. So and even if you go back to 1973 and 1979, which in our minds we think of as being a bigger crisis, though I'm not sure in the context of $147 oil in a banking crisis we want to say 73 was a bigger crisis. But even in that time, before we had some of the systems we have in place today, like a futures market and a strategic stockpiling system and the ability to, to ration consumers, that we didn't have a war among consuming nations for the shortage then either. So my contention is the conflict lines that we've seen over oil are not really likely to be U.S.-China conflict. Um, and that uh, the global financial crisis might even make it even more remote, as Dr. Clare is saying. It's sort of re, to quote uh, Vice President Biden in another concept, co context, it, there was sort of a reset button. Um, and what we're seeing is, especially with the new administration of uh, President Obama, but even under President Bush before him and the Democratic Congress, is that there's a greater attention in large consuming countries, not just here in the United States, but also in China and certainly in Europe, uh, to address the rise in oil demand so that post-recession uh, we might not see that kind of giant upward path uh, that we saw over the last decade, that we're going to see things like uh, better corporate average vehicle mileage standards here in the United States. So Ken and I have done some work on that. And we think at the 35 mile per gallon uh, target that was hit in the 2007 bill, that might shave something like two or three million barrels a day off U.S. oil demand. And indeed, given those new policies and other efficiencies coming into the a uh, private automobile system in the United States. Even the U.S. government now is predicting that oil demand might be flat in the United States out to 2030. And we've done some work where we've shown that if President Obama could actually put in his plan to get more plug-in and other kinds of more effective vehicles on the road and the state of California gets its way and imposes the restrictions that they are planning to impose in the state of California, that we might wind up having a car fleet by 2025 or 2030 that's getting 50 miles to the gallon. And that would result in, even with the rebound effect that we'd all drive a little more because our car gets such good gasoline mileage, that could wind up reducing U.S. oil demand by 7 million barrels a day. Exactly the number that people are currently projecting China to go up by. So, so maybe this conflict might be obviated by public policy. Right? We might have a tax on greenhouse gas, which might also lower energy demand trends and, and uh, move people away from certain fuels. So, so there are things that might happen between now and that sort of dismal future when we come out of the recession and demand starts to climb again that might mean that demand won't climb by the same rate. And the interesting thing I always find about historical statistics 
is that they're always very telling. So after, prior to 1973, global oil demand, that means all global oil demand, was growing at a rate of 7.6% per annum. So every year we're grow, growing by 7 or 8%. After 1979, that fell and we had this period of the current previous, you know, the cycle that just ended and global energy demand even with China and the great gains of the economic middle class in China and India and Brazil was only growing by 2% a year. So we think we could ask ourselves, you know, could the trend be different? I mean, instead of going back to 2 or 3% a year, might we go down to 1% a year? Um, and as we know, in the industrialized West and the OECD, demand has been flat. So sort of an interesting thing to think about. Now, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is not really where military conflict comes in oil among consuming nations, because I even take sort of a you know, passive view towards China going around and drilling in, in, in different places in the Caspian and so forth, because if you consider the world oil market like a swimming pool, if somebody takes a bucket of water and pours it into their end, the deep end, it means there's more water for us if we're in the shallow end. So there's just more water for everybody who's swimming, so I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, so, but the question is, if we think about the history of conflict in oil, who's the conflict been between that when it's been a military conflict? It's between one producer and another producer. Iraq and Iran in the 1980s. Uh, Iraq invading Kuwait in uh, 1990. So we have had this process uh, that has turned out to be quite dangerous for our economy um, and, and quite deleterious to the people living in the Middle East and the kind of sustainable economic development that they're entitled to, um, is all these wars that we have among producers who get in a conflict, sometimes over other things, but sometimes over control of the oil market. And I see a conflict like that brewing right now, um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in our new study, which is what I call the uh, uh, quadrilateral relationship, because it's not a triangle because it's more than three, between Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Russia. And you can see the outline of that conflict coming. It started in 2006 when Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is supported by Iran, and a lot of people think of Hezbollah as being a local Lebanese militia, but actually it was a militia planted in Lebanon by the Iranian government. The regulars of that uh, militia are actually Iranian military, military personnel who eventually recruited uh, Lebanese recruits. So that organization got in a conflict with the state of Israel. And there's been a tremendous amount of press in the United States, and I'm not going to go into that because that's not today's subject, about Israel's conflict with the Palestinians and the Gaza Strip and so forth. But the fundamental thing that the state of Israel, in my opinion, is focused on is that during that 2006 conflict with Hezbollah, Iran was supplying missile technology that was of a grave danger to people living in northern Israel. And as a result, and I think we as Americans can imagine it's in our minds post-September 11, but the media here doesn't play it up, over a million people from the city of Haifa in Israel and northern towns in Israel had to live in an air raid shelter underground with a gas mask for many weeks, you know, four to six weeks. And if you can imagine us here in Houston having to go underground because Hugo Chavez had missiles and we're all going to sit in the city of Houston underground waiting for our government to resolve it, you can imagine what a foreign policy priority it is to the government of Israel to resolve the possibility of Iran both having nuclear weapons and having missile technology. Because this is on the front page of the Israeli newspaper every single day. And the Israelis have discussed openly what they would have to do about it. I mean, suppose the international community doesn't resolve this and they feel at risk, what will they do about it? So there have been senior government officials in Israel that have said they would attack Iran. And the question is, will they bomb Bushir, the Iranian nuclear plant? What does that accomplish for them? Not much. 
they're going to have to attack something that would get incentivize the Iranian government to come to the negotiating table.